The fire scenes you just witnessed was not a Hollywood movie set, and the stars of the show were far from actors. They were real firefighters. The fire we're talking about is a Harvest Racket Club fire here in Dallas, Texas. Hello, my name is Eddie Burns. I'm fire chief of the Dallas Fire Rescue Department. The fire quickly grew to a seventh alarm fire, rendering it one of the worst fires in the city of Dallas. Most of the people that uh, escaped unharmed, they were only left with the clothes on their back. They began to ask us, what do we do? And our fire personnel told them that we had already called Red Cross and that Red Cross is on the way to help us. I'd like for you to meet Cheryl Sutterfield Jones, the Chief Executive Officer of the Dallas American Red Cross. She's the woman responsible to make sure that those calls get answered. Like Chief Burns, I recall the night that the Red Cross was activated to Harvey's Racket Club. Sent chills down my spine when I read the message on my Blackberry. Dallas Fire Rescue was requesting Red Cross to respond immediately to a seven alarm fire. Because the story of disaster can only be told by someone who experiences it, I want you to meet two women who are survivors of the Harvey's Racket Club fire. You can feel the heat. You can see the fire, I mean, just coming toward us. My name is Chantrell Garrett, and this is Priscilla Johnson, my best friend. <laughs> Sunday night, I was ready, waiting to look at CSI, and I seen smoke come from the TV. So I thought my TV was on fire. Then I seen smoke come from the vent. So I said, Trail, the apartment's on fire. We got up rushing, opened the front door, couldn't see nothing but black. Black is my dread. I mean, you couldn't see nothing. I went to the balcony and looked, and the fire was coming toward us. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die. What are we going to do? And said, no, we ain't going to die. It was, it was so hot. I mean, it don't, I felt the heat, but I didn't feel the heat. I don't know if they make any sense, but I felt it, but I just knew we had to get out of there. Because I just didn't want to be a victim. I just, you know. Uh -uh. And I put my prayers between the, the boards on the, on the patio so I could grab hold of it to climb down. And that's what I did. I got down a little bit and I told her to come on. She hysterical. She didn't want to do it. I told you, you got to come on. So the guy said, you got to jump. I said, no, I'm not going to leave my friend up there. So she finally came on down. And the prayers burned up in the fire, which I thank God for the prayers, because that's the only way we got down from the third floor. So by the time I got down, I was shaking and nervous, and it was raining, it was wet, and people were screaming. You could see people throwing kids off the balcony, and we didn't have any clothes on. No shoes, no socks, just a T-shirt and little boxing shorts. The Red Cross was out there immediately. They was out there, and they helped us a lot. They uh, escorted everybody down to the car wash and getting information and stuff and we found they had dog buses and I mean just everything was set up real good and they carried us to the Grotwiler uh, Recreation Center. We was in this fire and we like to die. I thank God and I thank God for Red Cross. I hope nobody have to ever go through this but we know it's gonna happen you never know when, because you can't say it's never going to happen to you, because I never thought it was going to happen to me. And thank you again, Red Cross, for helping me and my friend. I was on the USS Kennedy, deployed to Iraq. Married, baby on the way, husband deployed, all happened in about a month time frame. Our oldest child was a premature birth, so that made me a high-risk pregnancy. I was only four months at the time, and CJ began to efface and drop down lower as if he was going to go ahead and be delivered. So they were pretty sure that I needed to be in the bed with my feet up, and that's when they, it was decided that Corey should be there to help take care of our older child. My next thing to do was to contact the Red Cross. The Red Cross had already given us um, 
a set of instructions. I remember it was a red sheet of paper with everything lined out. It's, it's always a jolt to get anything from Red Cross because uh, you know there's an emergency going on. The way the Red Cross works to my understanding is that they get a message from the doctor and the member's uh, wife, of course, my wife, and a message is generated. That message is then sent to the command of the ship, which was there again, the USS Kennedy, and then handed down to my command, uh, my commanding officer. Once I'm notified of that instruction, they basically give me then my standing orders at that time to be ready to be shipped back home. I remember having a lot of support from the Red Cross in just helping me stay calm, um, knowing that they were going to do their very best to make sure the proper communication took place. So once the message was given, once my standing orders were given uh, to go back home and where I was going to be working at, it was a matter of operational schedule and getting my things together just that fast. I remember him having to physically carry me up and down stairs and everything. Just thinking about going every, it seemed like with each stage of, stage of the pregnancy, I imagined what would I have had to do if he hadn't been here, if he were still on the ship, how in the world, who in the world would have come in and helped and, and stood in his place. But it made me thankful that I really didn't have to find out the answer to a lot of those questions. It's, it's almost like uh, a prayer answered to just about anything. You need somebody, they're there. You call, someone's going to answer the phone. You have an emergency, they're going to help you. Uh, you have a situation, they're going to fix it. It's, it's Red Cross is my hero. We were um, having a pool party at my house, a group of moms. There were four moms, and then all of, all of us had our kids, so there were probably like what, two, four, six, about 10 kids there all together. And um, we broke for lunch, we were eating our hot dogs, and then all the kids afterwards went up to the uh, sandbox to play. And Linda was just getting ready to change her youngest diaper, and that's when she realized she had asked, has anybody seen Murphy or Riley? And um, so we kind of looked up in the sandbox, we didn't see him, and then Michelle looked over the fence and had said, oh my God, he's in the pool. We first took him out of the pool. He was very blue. When I held him, I could tell that his body weight was different. It wasn't that of somebody that, you know, could still wiggle around. So when we laid him down and she started the, the CPR, it didn't look like anything was happening. I didn't think that it was even working on him because it wasn't how I imagined it to be from the movies or even the videos sometimes that you see that they start coughing up water, you turn them onto their side and everything's going to be okay. If they had not done CPR on him, he, we would have a completely different outcome. It would have been something much more tragic. This is Riley today. He will be eight in September and when the accident happened he was a Almost three, so it's been almost five years ago. It'll be five years ago this summer. If something would have happened that day to Riley, knowing that I could have made a difference, I would have never forgiven myself. Lisa's decided to become a CPR instructor. To be prepared for the unexpected is really was, when it comes right down to it, what is so important. And the Red Cross gave us that ability, so. I always figure that's the least I can do to say thank you is to help spread that knowledge. For every disaster that you hear about and for the hundreds that you will never hear about, the Red Cross is always there. It's our mission, it's our purpose, and it's our privilege.